All right. Um, well, welcome, folks. Uh, so again, we're going to record the formal part of the presentation so that way we can post it up on the Canadian eLearning Network's uh, YouTube channel. And then uh, once we get past the formal part, we'll turn off the recording again. So that way we can have a, a little bit more frank discussion for folks who want to ask questions that they wouldn't necessarily want recorded. That would uh, be the opportunity to do that then. Uh, we'll have our... Um, our uh, contact information up at the end. So feel free to uh, contact us following this and that way we can uh, uh, follow up with anyone who uh, wants to have a deeper discussion or wants more information about this. Um, so I'm Michael Barber. I'm at Torrey University of California in uh, Vallejo, uh, which is in the North San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, my colleague here is Randy Labonte, who is the CEO for the Canadian eLearning Network. And for the last, I guess it's eight years now, we've been co-authoring uh, the State of the Nation K-12 <laughs> e-learning in Canada study. Um, before I sort of get into the, the meat of it, I wanna um, acknowledge and thank all of our sponsors here. And I know that some of you are, are belonging to some of the organizations we see on the screen here. Uh, I know at least one of you have retired from one of those organizations. So uh, we wanna thank all of them. Uh, some of them have been with us for a very long time. Um, particularly those those two on the top, Learn and Virtual School, or Virtual High School, sorry, but many of the others, such as CFED and uh, Vista Virtual School, and prior to that, ADLC, uh, the Open School BC in uh, uh, British Columbia have uh, been long partners with us. Uh, some of the others are relatively new, um, and others are returning with us. And in all honesty, without these folks, uh, this study wouldn't be possible every year. Uh, this report for the 2023 uh, report, which reports on the 2022-23 school year, uh, is the 16th one that we've done. And, and in all honesty, if it wasn't for these folks here, um, we likely would have given it up long ago, um, like has happened with some of the other studies, uh, which actually I'll mention in a second here now. Um, in addition to the sponsors, I want to point out that the Canadian eLearning Network is a partner uh, in this research. So uh, Randy, as a author, is works on this independent of his role at Can he Learn, although um, uh, it's largely due to his connection to Can he Learn that we've we've continued to do it and continue to work on. Um, so as I've mentioned, this is the 16th report, and I always like putting this slide up because it gives us a sense as to both where we've come from along the way, uh, as well as some of the folks that have uh, sponsored us and partnered with us alone. Uh, this originally started off as a North American Council of Online Learning, or NACL, report. Um, the following year, they rebranded to be the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, or iNACL, and they produced the report for many years. Uh, and then as soon as uh, um, Canny Learn was created, Canny Learn started uh, partnering with us on the report and a combination of Open School BC, as well as the Manitoba First Nations uh, <clears throat> Educational Resource Center were the ones that basically decided to help us publish this uh, on an annual basis. Um, and uh, so it's always nice to look at that. Uh, the report has morphed over the years or changed over the years so that right now it's largely a jurisdictional update and we talk about some of the trends in the printed report. Um, but if you go to the website, which is just K12SOTN for State of the Nation, uh, .ca, uh, if you click on the data and information tab there, you'll find each of the jurisdictional profiles. And that's just a more detailed version of what we have in the report. So the actual <clears throat> printed report or the PDF, what you find under the research reports link, um, usually just provides just what's changed in the past year. Uh, whereas what you find under the data and information is essentially all of the information that you would need to be able to understand uh, what's going on and, and how things operate in that particular province or territory. Um, the report each year basically relies upon, for the most part, four main data sources. Um, we survey all of the ministries of education or ministries of education and something, because many of them um, have multiple uh, departments that, that fall under that sort of broad umbrella. 
Uh, oftentimes we'll do either follow-up interviews or follow-up emails to clarify some of the things that we've uh, found. Um, we're doing a much better job these days uh, with document analysis. Um, the ministries have put up a lot more information on the web than what they have in the past. Um, we continue to rely upon that as well as things that we get from uh, popular media and other research that's being done out there. Um, we do an individual program survey where we try to get as many of the roughly 550 or so um, or 700. I can't remember. It's coming up in a slide in a couple of seconds. Uh, programs across the country to respond and provide us with information. Uh, prior to the explosion of private schools in Ontario, we had heard from about half of the online programs across the country. Uh, now that their number has exploded significantly, uh, that number has gone down significantly. Um, and then oftentimes we'll reach out to key stakeholders in each of the provinces and territories, uh, many of which are connected to us through the Canadian eLearning Network. If you're looking at recent years in terms of where the data from your jurisdiction has come from, um, you can see sort of where we've got the primary information from. Uh, we rely upon all four sources for every jurisdiction, but in many cases, it tends to be um, one source that kind of dominates things. Um, and you can see the, the main sources that are listed there for each of the jurisdictions. Uh, the ones that are in bold are the ones where either we haven't gotten the data, we've gotten incomplete data, or the data has been for previous school years. And the one I'll point out there um, is Ontario. Uh, so Ontario, when they respond to the data request in the late fall of the year, uh, so to use this year as an example, uh, we would have uh, received their response sometime in, in late fall of 2023. Um, instead of reporting on the 22-23 school year, uh, instead of reporting on the 21-22 school year, uh, the data that they provided was from the 2021 school year. And that's sort of a consistent feature that we've seen with Ontario. So the, the data that's provided uh, by the, the ministry is usually a, a year and a half old uh, when we're publishing it. Um, and uh, that's obviously a, a concern of ours, uh, both from a research standpoint, because um, it makes comparisons a little bit difficult. Uh, it's also a concern of ours because they're the only province in the country that requires students to learn online in order to graduate. Uh, students have to have two e-learning courses in order to graduate. And um, if data can't be certified for up to a year and a half, um, we're not sure what that means for determining whether or not students have met the graduation requirement beyond just taking the word um, of someone at the school level who puts it into the student information system. Um, but you know, that's one of the, the bigger issues that we've got coming up here. Uh, looking at the nature of regulation that we see across the country, um, this chart hasn't changed all that much in the 16 years that we've been doing it. Uh, there's been a couple of minor adjustments to it. Um, one of the misleading parts, you'll see that legislation is the one that's ticked for almost everybody. Um, and unfortunately, in most cases, the legislation basically just says the Minister of Education shall have the authority to regulate distance learning. And that's about all it says. Uh, some provinces, uh, Nova Scotia, um, Saskatchewan, uh, BC are notable exceptions to that, where they actually have a, a fair amount of regulatory language that's actually contained in the Education Act or the Schools Act, or in some cases, the Independent Schools Act. Um, but the others, for the most part, is just a passing reference. And so if you were to remove all of the legislation ones, other than the three that I said, you'll notice that a lot of jurisdictions really don't have much in the way of um, any sort of uh, regulatory environment that they operate under, um, which again is another one of those sort of concerning aspects that we uh, point out. Looking at the types of programs that you see across the country, um, and one of the things that we highlight in, in this year's report is looking at how this map has changed since we first started doing it. Uh, so you can see the, the Northern Territories as well as Atlantic Canada primarily rely upon um, the uh, single province-wide programs, or in the case of New Brunswick, it's two single province-wide programs because they've got one for the French uh, community and one for the, the English uh, uh, community as well. 
And um, then the rest of the country is sort of a little bit all over the place. Some areas are primarily at the district level. Uh, some are primarily at the uh, provincial level and most are a combination of the two. Um, and even the ones that are at the district level, um, one of the things that we note in this, actually we've noted in the last three reports, is that the distinction between primarily district-based and combined provincial and district-based is really, um, it, it's a distinction without meaning because in many cases, those programs that are operated at the district level have the ability to enroll students across the province. Um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario are all good examples of that. Um, in British Columbia now, under the new regime that started in the fall of this year, some of the schools, about half to two thirds of them, have the ability to enroll province wide. Um, you know, so the even though it's a district operated program, it's for all intent and purposes. Um, being run like it is a province-wide school. So that distinction is a little bit meaningless at this point. Um, and Randy and I have already started to have conversations about how we might want to change the way this particular map looks or how we might want to change the way uh, this is represented. Because if we look to our colleagues in the South who used to do the keeping pace uh, reports, um, one of the things that you have that they started doing was they looked at the and they would have it in two separate sections the jurisdictions that had fully online programs and then the jurisdictions that had supplemental programs and they wouldn't really care if they were operating in a state level or district level they looked at sort of the uh, amount that was going on um, that sort of morphed after a while where they started describing programs along these dimensions uh, that they came up with. And some of these work for our context here in Canada. Some don't. So uh, maybe something like this. Uh, the last couple of keeping pace reports that they did, they actually for each of the jurisdictions would go through and provide this sort of detailed chart for each one and even share what they felt about the availability of information that they could get out of those jurisdictions, uh, which I'm not sure that Randy and I would want to do, but let me tell you, sometimes I'm very tempted um, to be uh, able to score the availability of information and data that we get from different jurisdictions. Uh, uh, but I guess unlike the, my American colleagues, I don't know if I'm, I'm that um, predisposed to, to being that, I guess, mean about it. Because I think that is kind of mean to be, you know, to say that a jurisdiction is min provides minimal amount of information or is poor when it, in terms of the availability of information. Um, after a break of about four years, the Keeping Pace folks um, or the folks behind the Keeping Pace report uh, rebranded to be a snapshot report. And in that one, instead of looking at things by jurisdiction, which they had done for a long time, uh, they started looking at things by what they call sector. Uh, so ones that were public districts, uh, statewide uh, virtual schools, charter schools, which are mainly um, uh, uh, so, um, statewide full-time online programs there. And so, uh, again, some of these work in our environment, obviously the ones that are public school ones, uh, some of the province-wide online programs, the private schools work a little bit for us. Uh, the other ones, not so much. So uh, in terms of what we're going to do to to replace this, uh, it'll probably be some combination of, of these two, looking at these dimensions and then uh, potentially all of these questions that we've got here, uh, where you can say yes or no about different jurisdictions um, to give a sense as to the, the nature and type of activity that's happening. Um, but that's a little bit of a preview of, I guess, what's coming. Um, looking at what we found for the 22-23 school year. Uh, so if you go across the country in terms of the amount of activity, uh, you can see that after province by province, you know, we've, we've uh, got great variation. So nationally, we've got about six and a half percent of the students are taking one or more courses online. 
Um, there are a couple of jurisdictions there that are at about the national average, uh, New Brunswick and, and Ontario. Um, and the Yukon, there are a few, uh, mostly in Western Canada, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC, that are well ahead of the national average. And then most of Atlantic Canada, um, Quebec to some extent, as well as most of the North, are well below that national average. Um, if you look at what that national average has been since we started the study, um, so the first number we've got up there actually comes from a Canadian Teachers Federation report that was released in 2000, where they estimated that about 25,000 kids across the country were engaged in one or more distance uh, learning courses, which at the time would have been about a half a percent of all of the K-12 students. Um, since we started tracking, you can see that there's been a, a steady uptick for the first five to six years. Um, I suspect that had more to do with um, better data collection than it actually did with a jump of, um, well, really a hundred percent increase over the first five years that we were tracking. Uh, you'll see that from really 20, uh, 10, 20, or sorry, 2011, 2012, up through to really 2019, 2020, uh, until the pandemic hits. There's not that much of a difference. Uh, you know, there's only a basically a 1% variation over that period of 10 years. Um, obviously, during the first couple of pandemic years, we saw a dramatic spike. Um, and since then, it's sort of leveled off. And it's interesting, because if you plot this on a graph, it actually has a nice little, if you're doing it by one percentage points along the side, uh, if you exclude the 2020-21 and the 21-22 years, um, there's a fairly nice linear uh, slope that comes with it. Now, it's obviously a fairly flat slope because we're still only talking about less than 10% of the kids across the country engaged in this, um, but it is a, a nice little slope minus those two blips that are there. Um, to give you a sense as to how this has changed across each of the individual provinces over, say, the last five years, um, you can see these figures there. Uh, a couple to, to point out, um, Ontario, you can see, has had a fairly significant jump uh, from the pre-pandemic stage to the post-pandemic stage. Uh, some of that has to do with the mandatory requirement, uh, although keep in mind that Again, the Ontario figures should all be shifted to to the uh, left because the, what we have listed in the 22-23 school year, because that's the year they gave us the data for, uh, that roughly 130,000, that's actually the number of students that were learning online in 2020-21. Um, so you can you know, see that they started, if you, you know, make that adjustment, that 139,000, which is where they peaked, would have been the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, so there would have been a, a jump pre-pandemic, uh, as you can see in Ontario, that sort of started to level off a little bit. Um, and it'd be interesting to see what numbers there are actually in these two years when it comes to the mandatory courses. Um, a couple of others, you can see Manitoba has had a significant decline um, in there. Uh, by the same token, Saskatchewan has had almost a doubling of numbers uh, during this five-year period. Obviously, again, the COVID years uh, blipped up. Um, Alberta, I would caution against looking at the last two date years of data, uh, because if you go back to the methodology chart, you'll note that uh, the Ministry of Education wasn't able to release any data to us over the last two years, um, trying to get permissions from all of the ADMs and DMs that have to sign off on things. Uh, has become much more problematic in Alberta. Uh, so um, that number could be significantly higher. And I suspect that the 22-23 year probably is significantly higher. Uh, we were conservative in our estimate and just estimated about 10%. Uh, in much the same way we estimated this one to be about 11%, um, just because we inflated a little bit for COVID. Um, but you can see the numbers again, if you look from here to here, you see that steady growth. And when you look at it on a percentage basis, um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see that, um, you know, we 
uh, we've seen that steady increase. So if you look at like the Ontario numbers, you see, you know, four and a half percent up to six and a half percent. Alberta, again, if you get rid of um, these two years here, which were estimates on our part, 10 to 13. Uh, BC, again, 10 to 10. There have actually been one of the most consistent. And if we were to continue this back, um, BC has been in around that 10% range now for about a decade. Um, so it's uh, been a very consistent level for British Columbia that roughly one out of every 10 um, have joined. Um, since Mike is in the room and Mike's from New Brunswick, he's actually in the, the ministry, um, I'll point out the, the New Brunswick one. You can see a nice 2% jump there, uh, which I, I think is one of the larger jumps numerically speaking as you're looking across this chart. I think probably second only to Saskatchewan, which has seen a significant jump from one side to the other. Um, in terms of the number of distance programs, this is an, an interesting one because even in jurisdictions where there were a fair number of programs in the first place, um, we've seen a, a, a significant growth in many of them. Uh, the ones I'll point out in particular, if you look at Ontario, and that's, I think, the, the main one to focus upon there. Um, you know, they were basically you had 60 school divisions, 60 school boards that uh, had some form, most had some form of distance learning. And then you had the 12 francophone boards that were all in a single program. So that gives you about 61. And then there were about 20 um, private programs that were around for a while. And then that decreased down to about 10. And then once the COVID hit and the online, the e-learning mandate came in, you see the number of programs jumps to 240. And if you get rid of the 61 public ones we were talking about there, that means that, you know, you're looking at what, 180 odd private programs uh, in 21-22. And if you go to the following year, it means like 460 private programs that are there, um, you know, and that's a, a real significant number. And no other jurisdiction has seen that kind of growth. Uh, but, the only but, ones that come close are Saskatchewan and Alberta, where you see a bit of an increase, uh, you know, Saskatchewan going from 14 to 38, uh, Alberta going from 33 to 46, but nothing like what we see in Ontario. Randy, you wanted to jump I, in. Here. I was just going to say a, a caution on the numbers of private schools in that the ministry uh, requires that the schools register with them uh, for that. And that may mean that they are intending to, and they've registered to get approval to offer the, the diploma. Uh, the question is whether or not they actually are active, how many students they've recruited, etc. So having gone through that list and looked at websites, I can tell you that some looked like not really legitimate. So that number of, in terms of operations is not accurate. It's just a question of registration with the ministry. Yeah, and, and they've been pretty good in terms of giving us the numbers. Like they send us, here's the number of fully online private schools. And then here's the number of brick and mortar private schools that are also registered to offer online courses. Um, as Randy suggests, though, the number that are actually offering courses, um, you know, and how many of them have any sort of significant numbers, because even many of those brick and mortar private schools they may only have a couple of students that were face to face with them last year and had to leave for a year, but fully intend on coming back. So they made, because it's a private school and they've got the flexibility, they made accommodations for those one or two students for that one year to allow them to continue to go to fancy private school A. Right. And they could be also targeting a specific group, a specific area because it's international. Uh, as well, uh, in terms of being able to augment some uh, entry into Canada to a post-secondary. So there's a lot of reasons and there's a lot of variations in, in how they are. When we say an online school, you just think of the full gambit of courses that are available. But it may be very, something very much more specific, as I found in looking at different websites and how they describe what their program was. And actually, Randy, I'm glad you, you mentioned the international aspect because it is one of the things worth noting here. Of all of these jurisdictions here, uh, Ontario is the only jurisdiction listed here where a private online school can offer um, credit for online courses to students who aren't in Canada. 
Um, some of the other jurisdictions will allow them to offer to students in another province and then transfer them in for credit in the province that they're living in or the province that they are uh, taking the course from. Uh, but Ontario is the only one that once you are registered with the, the Ministry of Education, you have the ability to offer Ontario academic credit um, and the Ontario Secondary School Diploma to any student that enrolls, regardless of where they are living. Uh, so in addition to the e-learning requirement um, that might be driving some of this growth, the ability to enroll students from China or India or throughout Africa, South America, really anywhere in the world, any Asian country, you know, European country, what have you. And if they were to take the right sequence of courses uh, and take enough of them, they could get an Ontario Secondary School Diploma, having never stepped foot in Canada a day in their life. Um, so there's a number of factors that could be driving that particular growth that you see there. Um, in terms of blended learning, you'll notice that this is an old graph because uh, with 2017, 2018 was when we stopped actually formally tracking it. We still ask the jurisdictions about it because some jurisdictions actually do keep reasonable numbers around it, um, others not so much. Uh, so we don't provide sort of this breakdown anymore. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of asterisks. Uh, on that particular slide that are associated with them. Because what was happening was in some cases, and I'll, I'll use Nova Scotia as a good example, just about every student in Nova Scotia had an account in the provincial learning management system. And if their teacher wanted them to, they could request access for these courses. Um, New Brunswick was a similar thing, although they didn't do it for everyone. It was based on demand. So if if I, as a face-to-face -face teacher living in, in Moncton or St. John or wherever, decided that, you know, that that online course that they've got for, for history, I think they've got some really good content in there. I'm going to put in a request so that I can get an account in the provincial learning management system. I can enroll my students in that system so that they can get access to that content so that we can leverage that in our in my classroom instruction. Um, and so in some cases, those numbers are a little bit more reliable because obviously the ones where you have instructors that are requesting it, they're obviously more likely to be the ones who are using it. Um, jurisdictions where they basically just enroll everyone or where you have complete school boards that are sending in the entire school board's enrollment to this particular uh, model, those become less reliable. Um, so, and in many cases, it was just the online programs themselves that were uh, partnering with schools and doing this. Uh, the only sort of really reliable numbers that are there are the ones from the Yukon because they have a single territory wide blended program that they manage. Um, and then the federal numbers, because within the federal nominal role up until 2017, 2018, when they were uh, still sending us those, um, they had a very specific number in terms of how many were coded as being hybrid or blended. And there were, I think, three or four different codes in their nominal role that allowed for that. Um, so other than those two jurisdictions, the others are just, uh, I won't even say best guesses because um, they're the only data that we had available is probably the best way of describing it. Um, over the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about remote learning and how that's a little bit different than um, virtual learning or, or online learning. Um, and this is the first year where we haven't had a specific section in the report uh, over the last three years uh, for that. Um, you'll notice that this is a Canny Learn project that Randy and myself and a couple of others were involved in uh, that looks at essentially uh, the provinces and territories responses to remote learning at various stages. So uh, the gray one is basically a sort of a background to the distinctions between remote learning and normal online learning and what that looks like in a, a K-12 setting. Um, the green one was basically looking at what happened in the spring of 2020. Uh, the orange one was looking at how folks got ready for the fall of 2020 um, around Christmas time. And you can sort of see a theme going with the colors. Uh, the red one, uh, we wanted to get some stories from 
uh, students, parents, teachers, administrators. I think we've even got one ministry official in there about, you know, how things how things actually looked on the ground. So essentially what the things we were describing in these first two reports actually looked like from the perspective of those individuals. Um, this yellow one here was looking at how uh, the full 2020-21 school year went. Um, this blue one here looked at um, the reopening in the fall of 21. And then at the end of the 21-22 school year, we did these uh, this bilingual one here that essentially looked at two years of, of pandemic learning um, and how different jurisdictions fared and what they did and um, how successful many of those measures were. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if, if you really want to get an understanding of that, uh, to look through those. If memory serves me correct, this year in the State of the Nation report, I think there were only three jurisdictions that reported that they still had any measures related to remote learning uh, left. Uh, so most jurisdictions uh, had moved on from that sort of pandemic style and were back to the regular type of, of distance online learning that existed in the 2019-2020 school year before COVID hit. Um, in terms of some general trends that we're seeing, um, the fact that there's only three jurisdictions that paid any attention in 2022-23 uh, to remote learning means that we're getting to this new normal that everyone kept talking about. Um, obviously, because of the pandemic, we've seen a much greater interest in, and if you remember the numbers, there was one of the more significant jumps that we've seen in the proportion of students uh, from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic that were involved in this. Uh, one of the difficulties is that um, in many cases, just because they're more aware of it doesn't mean that they understand it. And in a lot of jurisdictions, um, on well, remote learning got a bad rap, which means that online learning got tarred with the same brush, if you will. Um, and uh, so that's been a, a difficult thing. But we've seen the trend return to, to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, interestingly, leading into the pandemic, and many of them were supposed to conclude around 2000 or 2020, we had a lot of review processes where different jurisdictions had been going through either in an external fashion where they were engaging stakeholders or internally looking at their own processes uh, and reviewing essentially how they could create uh, regulatory environments, regulatory regimes for distance and online learning. Um, many of those were about to finish when the pandemic hit. And in the past year, most of them have reported that, actually almost all of them have reported that they've both finished the review process and in most cases actually put in place the things that were necessary to start um, those new systems. So for many of those jurisdictions, fall 23 meant that the online schools that were operating in those uh, provinces and territories were now operating under a new regulatory regime um, that began in many places before COVID. Uh, with the exception of a couple of provinces, we've also seen a, a move towards greater uh, centralization. Um, both of services and of programs. And for all of these points, there, there's outliers for them. And, and one of the main outliers I'll point out is, is the province of Quebec. Um, Quebec is a jurisdiction where online learning is not uh, well received there. Uh, for the most part, prior to COVID, it was just sort of went under the radar and those who were engaged in it sort of did so without much uh, notice or attention from the, the ministry there. Um, since COVID, uh, one of the things that we've seen happen is a real backlash against distance learning there. Uh, so for the most part, it's only provided for um, individuals who are sort of in extreme situations and unable to attend school, or they've left the formal uh, school system. And this is a way to essentially try to provide uh, some of those, those, that secondary level learning that they missed out on. Um, there are other outliers on, on many of these points throughout the country, but Quebec tends to be uh, one of the bigger ones that are there. Uh, so again, a reminder that the um, website has all of uh, this information, all of the reports, all 16 of them, as well as many special uh, ones that we've done. Um, each of the jurisdictional profiles uh, has both the regulatory environment, 
um, the level of activity of, of online and blended learning. It'll have links to the profiles for all of the previous reports. So you can actually look at an individual uh, jurisdiction and see how it's changed year to year. Um, in addition to that, there are some vignettes, which are sort of more uh, stories or narratives about uh, online learning or distance learning or blended learning in that particular jurisdiction. Uh, many of them, although not all, uh, do have some brief issue papers where we've asked folks that uh, have much greater expertise or experience with uh, e-learning in that particular jurisdiction to dive into a specific topic that was impacting nationally or in some cases just that individual jurisdiction. Um, and those tend to be in the three to six page range. So they tend to be a bit more detailed, whereas the vignettes are uh, just a single page. Um, each one has a little bit of a history of e-learning in that province. So you can see how it has how distance learning uh, has developed uh, over time. And then finally, there is the most recent response uh, that we've received from every single jurisdiction to the individual program survey. Uh, so you can go in and check to see if your program responded last year or not. Um, and uh, it's always difficult for the folks that are representing the uh, particularly Atlantic Canada and the North because they are the single province ones, and most of those are run by the ministry. And um, those folks have a great tendency to respond to the ministerial survey uh, and then fail to respond to the individual program survey. Uh, so that'll probably be one of the main trends you could see there. Um, here is my email address and information. Uh, Randy, you can drop yours in the chat because then you can copy and paste Randy's, uh, whereas you actually have to remember mine because you can't copy and paste from the slide. And uh, I will stop sharing here now because we are about 36 minutes in and uh, entertain your questions and comments. I will also stop the recording at this time.